Good morning, New Beginnings. It's me, Pastor Danish House. Today is Tuesday, March 15th, 2022. Thank you so much for joining me for this daily update and devotional video. I'm glad you decided to make me part of your life today, and I'm delighted that you are part of my life as well. Uh, today, Tuesday, we have uh, no church events planned and no birthdays. There is Celebrate Recovery tonight for men and for women at 6.30 p.m. That's at Full Gospel Center in their sanctuary. Full Gospel Center is around the traffic circle from Arlington High School, just a little bit down the road. And uh, yeah, Celebrate Recovery for men and for women. Uh, our meeting there at 6.30 um, and if you'd like to give to help support the ministry of Christian and Missionary Alliance, comma, services in Ukraine, here's the web address for you to go to. It's https secure.commaservices.org slash comma give slash hashtag gift dash form. And you can pause the video here to write that down or it'll be up on your screen again at the end of our time together today. I mentioned yesterday that uh, Jordan Laborde, at, who preached, was our outreach pastor here at New Beginnings Church, and who preached this past Sunday, had tons and tons of additional stuff that he wanted to say. And so he asked me if he could uh, record some of the daily devotional videos this week. And so it's my pleasure today to be able to give you the first one. Um, here is Jordan Laborde on Christian purity rituals. Good morning, New Beginnings. This is Jordan, and I'm here to share with you a little bit more about purity laws in the Bible, and how they apply to Christian living. In summary, if as Christians we are God's people, then it's important for us to represent him accurately and honorably. That's why the command given to God's people, Israel in the Old Testament, still applies to Christians today. Be holy, for I am holy. Leviticus 11.45 Laws in the Old Testament set up boundaries that separated God's people from sin and sinful peoples. The purity laws in the Old Testament were given to insulate God's people not only from sin and unholiness, but from things associated with sin. Today, these purity laws are no longer commands that Christians need to follow, because Christ's blood purifies us from all sin for all time. But although the mechanisms God has given us for maintaining our purity and holiness have changed, the end goal still remains the same. Pure hearts and lives that are unstained by anything that displeases him. On Sunday, I noted that there are two purity rules that set up boundaries for the Christian behavior and community, love and repentance. If we are living lives of love towards God and others, our hearts and our whole bodies will remain pure. And when we mess up, we are to be typified by immediately seeking forgiveness through repentance. All this is true and good. On the other hand, while the Old Testament laws and rituals of purification are no longer necessary, they still contain kernels of wisdom that are useful and important for helping us live lives that avoid sin and are lived out in love. Tomorrow we'll look at some of those, but today we're going to look at uniquely Christian purification rituals. As Christians, we believe that Christ's death achieves forgiveness for our sins and cleansing from uncleanness when we believe in him through faith, but we practice several purification rituals that symbolize and remind us of these spiritual realities. Baptism is a literal immersion or sprinkling with water, which symbolizes our death to hearts of stone and our raising up into life with hearts of flesh given to us by the spirit of life. It also symbolizes the washing away of our sins. Baptism is not necessary for salvation, but it is a good reminder of the purpose of Christ's death for new believers. Furthermore, while Old Testament priests had to wash often to maintain purity, the cleansing which Christ's death achieves for us is lasting. And so we are only baptized once upon confessing Jesus as Lord. Communion is another purification ritual that symbolizes and reminds us of Jesus's sacrifice on our behalf. Once a year, in the Old Testament, the high priest would enter the holiest place to offer a sacrifice on what was known as the Day of Atonement. This sacrifice cleansed the entire nation of any unknown or unpunished sins. The blood of an unblemished lamb symbolized the death of the innocent and pure in place of the guilty and the unclean. 
For us as Christians, Jesus is our lamb. And so once a month, we symbolically remember his substitutionary death. But something's different, that in communion, we symbolically drink Christ's blood and eat Christ's body. Blood in the Old Testament was extremely holy. People weren't even allowed to eat meat if it contained blood. But in Christ, we have been made completely holy. And so we are able to take part in blood symbolically. While this doesn't happen literally, it's usually grape juice or in pandemic times, cough syrup, it's meant to symbolize that instead of God merely punishing Jesus instead of us and apart from us, the Holy Spirit unites us to Christ so that his punishment is our punishment and his righteousness is our righteousness. In that way, Christ is holiness in us. And it doesn't depend on our own efforts or our own substance. Scripture warns us, about communion, saying that we should not participate in communion lightly, because to do so might bring our uncleanness into contact with God's holy blood. So communion should always be preceded by repentance, even for sins that we may have forgotten. Finally, foot washing is a purification ritual not found in the Old Testament law, but found in the life and the teachings of Jesus. Shortly before, before his crucifixion, Jesus washed his disciples' feet, and he commanded them to do so for each other. Early Christians did this often, and I have participated in foot washing several times with other believers. Foot washing is supposed to symbolize the type of leaders which Christians are supposed to be, and how we should deal with everyday sins and grime in the world. Christian leaders are not called to positions of highest honor without being asked to serve the least in their church. And we are called to help our brothers and sisters to confess their sins by facilitating an environment that forgives easily with hearts full of grace and mercy. How much more should we forgive each other if Christ forgave us? So, in summary, baptism, communion, and foot washing are all Christian purity rituals. None of these are necessary, but all of them are important and useful for Christian living. These purification rituals symbolize the boundaries of the church, the boundaries of God's holy people. What role did they play in your life? Have you been baptized? Do you recognize the importance of repentance when you take communion? And are you willing to help others seek and receive forgiveness? I'll come back tomorrow and we'll talk a little bit about Old Testament purity laws, but for now, those are the questions I want you to think about. Have a good day. Praise God. Well, let's, uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you so much for your love for us. Thank you that in your love for us, you lead us and you guide us into the way of truth and purity um, and uh, love and repentance. God, I pray that you would uh, bless us, Lord, as we strive to walk in your way. And Lord, give us grace for the ways in which we fall short. Uh, Lord, you are making for yourself a church that is, uh, it is uh, clean and spotless. Uh, and uh, I pray, Lord, that you would help us to, to become that in your eyes. And of course, we, we become that through the blood of Jesus Christ shed on the cross for our sins. Lord, we love you and we trust you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us for this daily update and devotional video. I love you new beginnings, and I, love, I look forward to talking to you again tomorrow.